How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first of what we hope will be many Get Talking event. My name is Elle Lamboy, and I am the Senior Director of Membership and Philanthropic Communications for Gettysburg Foundation. And Gettysburg Foundation is the nonprofit partner to Gettysburg National Military Park and Eisenhower National Historic Site. And we're excited to be partnering with Gettysburg National Military Park for this event. So 154 years ago, Gettysburg and the battle that raged through this town was known to many as the turning point of the Civil War. And today, I think it's fair to say, Gettysburg is the focal point of another important time in our nation's history. So as Chris and I, in our various positions at Gettysburg Foundation and Gettysburg National Military Park, have noticed the headlines surrounding our nation's history, and in particular, Civil War history and Gettysburg's history, are heated. They are intimidating to some and confusing to many. So we thought, why not get together and just talk it out and have a civil conversation about the history behind some of the headlines, how they're making everyone feel, address some questions and concerns, and how we can all move forward. So Chris is going to lead us in the discussion tonight, and he has 10 years of experience working with the National Ten Park years, Service. Yeah. 10 years. And so at some of our nation's most important and contentious sites. So we are going to open the dialogue to our audience here. I also was emailed some questions ahead of time. And of course, we're excited to take questions and feedback from our social media audience. So if you're interested in asking a question, you can post your comment live right underneath me. Or if you're <laughs> multitask social media-ing, you can tweet us a question using hashtag get talking. And get has two T's for Gettysburg. So without further ado, are you ready to get talking? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, I'm going to kick it off to Chris. Thanks for joining us this evening. Well, uh, thank you, Al, and thank you, uh, everyone in the Gettysburg Foundation, for hosting this. I think this is a great opportunity to talk about uh, an issue that's important, not just for us in Gettysburg, but all across the nation, from Boston and New York, up north where I'm from, to uh, New Orleans, Richmond, Virginia, Charleston, South Carolina. And it's really a, a, an issue that we've been grappling with uh, not just in the recent past, but all the way back to the years of the American Civil War. So for 150 years, uh, we've been having this, this debate, sometimes very heated and sometimes a violent debate, about how we remember uh, the darkest chapters in our national past. Um, not just the American Civil War, but particularly the Confederacy, how we remember the Confederacy, how we remember what the Confederacy represented, uh, what individual Confederates were fighting for, and how uh, that manifests itself in our public spaces today. So certainly... Uh, town squares across the country, monuments and memorials in big cities, but also how it plays out in national parks like Gettysburg. So uh, thank you for allowing me to be here, and thank you for allowing me to be uh, part of this conversation. And I think a great place to kind of begin this, kind of frame what we're talking about, is really to go all the way back to the Battle of Gettysburg. So let's go back to July 3rd, 1863. It's the third day of the Battle of Gettysburg. And it's uh, the climactic moment of the battle. It's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's Pickett's Charge. And Pickett's Charge, for those of us who are familiar with the battle, we, we know what that means. But if you're not as familiar, Pickett's Charge is kind of Robert E. Lee's last desperate gamble for victory at Gettysburg. And it involves about 12,000 Confederate infantrymen from Virginia, uh, Mississippi, Tennessee, North Carolina, making a frontal assault across this mile of open ground between Seminary Ridge and Cemetery Ridge, the position of the Union Army. And one of the uh, Union soldiers that was on Cemetery Ridge that day was a 34-year-old lieutenant, and his name was Frank Haskell. And everyone who fought in the battle that day and who survived would never forget what they went through and what they saw. And Frank Haskell, he survived, and he uh, wrote a letter to his brother describing what he saw on Cemetery Ridge that day. And Frank Haskell, he was a really good author, so he had this very descriptive way of describing what he saw. And it's one of the best primary source accounts we have of, of Pickett's charge, that, that Haskell letter. And Haskell uh, wrote to his brother, and he described what he saw as these 12,000 Confederates are making their way across the battlefield. And he, uh, he said what, what stuck out to him, or many things, but one of them were the, the Confederate battle flags that he saw. And each regiment involved in Pickett's charge had their own unique battle flag that they would carry as they were advancing across, again, this mile of open ground. And uh, Frank Haskell... Uh, he, he called them these red flags that seemed to come on like a wave. And to Frank Haskell, that 34-year-old Union lieutenant, uh, that flag meant something. That Confederate symbol meant something to him. And to Haskell, it meant an imminent threat to his survival. So that, that was the enemy that was coming towards him. And that flag represented the Confederate army, his foe, 
and everything that Confederate Army was fighting for. And to Frank Haskell, that battle flag, that battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia, to him it represented treason, it represented rebellion. And that's what that flag had, uh, that's the meaning that flag had to Haskell. Now, one of the Confederate soldiers making his way across the battlefield was a man by the name of John Eakin. And John Eakin is from Bedford County, Virginia. And he's the color bearer of the 28th Virginia. So he's carrying that battle flag. And uh, Eakin, he's, um, he's not a rich man. He's a farmer, again, from Bedford County. Uh, he didn't own any slaves, and he never would. And to John Eakin, when he looked up at that flag that he was carrying, it meant something completely different to him than it did for Frank Haskell. So for John Eakin, what that flag represented was, was his home. And maybe the residents of Bedford County gave that flag to the regiment before they marched off to battle. And so that had that, that meaning to him. It was his home. It was his family. It was what he was fighting for. And Eakin probably also represented the Confederacy and what the Confederacy was all about and why Eakin himself was fighting, however he interpreted that. Uh, and Eakin also would have appreciated, I think, the tactical value of the battle flag. So... Uh, in the American Civil War, each regiment had a battle flag. And as they would advance into combat, I mean, things get very chaotic very quickly. So the air is full of smoke, the sound drowns out almost everything. So if you're a soldier and you're in the heat of battle, you might not be able to see your commanding officer, you might not be able to hear the orders of your lieutenants and your captains, but, but through the smoke and kind of fog of war, you might see the battle flag. And so wherever that flag was going to go, you would go as well. So it played this really important tactical role. And Eakin, as he's making his way across the battlefield, he looks up at the flag he's carrying, he probably recognized that. And his role, his responsibility to safeguard that very important tool for the regiment. Now, at the exact same time that Frank Haskell is on Cemetery Ridge looking at the Confederate flags, the exact same time John Eakin is carrying the Confederate battle flag across the battlefield, here in town, only a few blocks from where we are right now, uh, is the home of a man by the name of Michael Jacobs. He was a local Gettysburgian. He was a professor at uh, Pennsylvania College, it's Gettysburg College today. And Michael Jacobs actually watches part of Pickett's Charge from his house. And today, you, I mean, modern development has kind of blocked the view, but in 1863, if you're Michael Jacobs, you can go up to the third floor of your house, you can look out the window, and you can see part of the, the battlefield. You can see Pickett's Charge. And sometimes I think about what that battle flag might have meant to Michael Jacobs. As Jacobs looks out at this battle unfolding literally in his backyard, he probably saw that flag, and to him it meant uh, literally the army that was occupying his hometown, uh, the army that had made him a prisoner for three days in his own house, uh, the army that had left the streets of his community littered with the dead and dying, uh, the army that was stealing the property of local citizens. So what the flag meant to Michael Jacobs was different than John Egan, it was different than Frank Haskell. And then just down the street from Michael Jacobs was the home of a man by the name of Jack Hopkins. And just down the road from him was the Abram Bryan family. And just across Abram Bryan's backfield was the home of Mag Palm. And just across the battlefield was the home of the James Warfield family, all members of Gettysburg's African-American community. And when Abram Bryan or James Warfield or Mag Palm looked at that same symbol, that same Confederate battle flag, it meant something completely different again to them. To them, it was a tangible symbol of enslavement. Uh, that flag to them represented the threat to their freedom and the freedom of their family members. So during the battle, uh, Abram Bryan, James Warfield, Jack Hopkins, they fled. They left the community. Um, the point, I think, is that even in 1863, even in July, uh, the last day of the battle, that battle flag and that Confederate symbol and that Confederate piece of iconography, it meant different things to different people. And really, fast forward 154 years, 155 years, that same dynamic is still in play today. So when I go out on the battlefield and I go to Cemetery Ridge where Frank Haskell uh, was positioned during the battle, or when I go to Seminary Ridge and I have a group of visitors and we're next to the Virginia Memorial and we're talking about Pickett's Charge, uh, all of the people on my, my tour or all the people I'm taking across the battlefield, if we're underneath the Virginia Memorial, they can look at the Virginia Memorial, and that memorial, that piece of bronze and stone, means different things to the people on the tour. Or we could talk about the Confederate battle flag, and we could go into the museum galleries at the Museum and Visitor Center, and we can look at one of the Confederate battle flags we have in, in our collection. And I might be with 10 people, and I'll have 10 different viewpoints of what that flag means. 
and what that flag represents. So on the one hand, on the one kind of end of the ideological spectrum, someone might look at that flag and to them, that's a symbol of, uh, of their heritage. It's part of how they define themselves and who they are and where they come from. And so they're rightly proud of that and they're protective of it. On the opposite side of the spectrum, someone might look at that flag and see, rather than a symbol of heritage, a symbol of, of hate or racism or, or violence, a very tangible reminder of one of the darkest chapters in our national past. And in the middle, you might have someone who looks at that and they're completely apathetic. It's a meaning devoid of any, or it's a symbol devoid of any real meaning. It's just a, a dusty artifact in a museum gallery. And I think part of our problem, and it's really a big challenge, is to look at the Confederate battle flag, or to look at the Virginia Memorial on the battlefield, or the North Carolina Memorial, or any of them, and be able to see that, that piece of imagery, or that, that symbol, from the vantage point of someone who might uh, be very different than ourselves. And that's a really challenging thing to do. And I think that's one thing that we can maybe attempt to do just by having this conversation. So I'll throw it out to the people in the room and to you all watching online. When you drive down West Confederate Avenue, when you're exploring the battlefield, and you see uh, the Virginia Memorial, uh, what, what emotions does that, that bring to you? What, what meaning do you find in it? And there's no really right or wrong answer. It just depends on your perspective and where you come from. So, not being rude, I'm going to check yeah. if anyone's asking online, but yeah, the room. This is a civil space. Feel free to say whatever you think, but what thoughts does that bring to you when you're driving down and see that huge monument of Robert E. Lee at the top? I often think of the sacrifice of those soldiers that marched across there, uh, you know, being mm -hmm. a battlefield. I think, wow, imagine you know, lining up and marching towards, you know, that uncertain fate. Um, I'm not a Virginian, I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania, uh, but just thinking about that sacrifice and the, the bravery it would take to do that is what goes through my mind. Well, that's, um, I think that's a big challenge on battlefields, because battlefields today, uh, when you drive around the park, they're, they're usually very beautiful. They're pastoral, they're agricultural, and I think one of the things that's really difficult for us to do is to go back in time and put ourselves in the, in the boots of a soldier or a nurse or a volunteer in the immediate aftermath of the battle, and to get that very visceral sense of what is a battlefield in the aftermath of the battle. What does that mean? What does it look like? And it, Gettysburg today is beautiful. It's a park. It's pastoral. It's serene. It's solemn. Uh, but it's very difficult for us to get that sense of sacrifice. And we talk about Pickett's Charge, for example. Pickett's Charge, for the Confederates involved, is, is an absolute disaster. It's a, it's a in terms of, of sheer carnage, it's difficult for us to, to, to grapple with that and to get any real sense of it. So that, again, the climactic moment of the battle is Pickett's Charge. Those 12,000 Confederates advance across that mile of open ground towards the Union position. And in, in terms of duration, Pickett's Charge is relatively short. It's only 45 minutes from beginning to end. And in those 45 minutes, uh, nearly 50% of the Confederate soldiers involved in the attack become casualties. It's 50%. Uh, virtually half of the men that make that assault are either killed or wounded or captured, and even for those men that are captured. So some Confederates make it all the way to the Union battle line. Uh, there's this vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting at the high water mark, what we call the angle today. And a lot of those Confederates, they surrender, they become prisoners of war, and that's a gamble. You might go off to a prisoner of war camp and a few months later you'll be paroled, or you could die of malaria or typhoid. And one of the things I think the monuments on the battlefield do is they do drive home that sense of, of, of death and carnage and loss. Uh, whether it's uh, the War Department tablets that line the battlefield that list a kind of numerical, uh, a numerical sense of, of how much uh, a particular unit suffered, or when you look at the Virginia Memorial uh, and the figures at the base of it, and you can maybe, even if it's only in a kind of manufactured sense, you can put a face with what you know is this horrific Confederate assault by looking into the eyes of, of some of the men that are, that are pictured on that memorial. So that's a perfectly valid and a perfectly reasonable thing that reminds uh, us of the sacrifice involved and the death involved in, in the, uh, the battle. I'm glad you brought up the, the statues at the bottom because we got a really interesting observation from Linda online who says, but statues are a tribute to heroes and some people might have a difficult time considering Confederate leaders as true heroes since they are fighting to dissolve a union they were sworn to protect. So were those monuments put up as 
kind of to to memorialize mm -hmm. heroes or was it more the veterans coming to to honor a place that they fought how would you help her understand yeah well what i would say is i think a lot of the union veterans who are alive in the 1890s the early 1900s and even the 19 teens would actually agree with what linda said so um the virginia memorial that we have today is actually dedicated in 1917 and it, the, the primary driver behind that was actually the, the state of virginia but in 1903 uh, almost two decades before, the state of Pennsylvania and the state of Virginia got together and they both were going to attempt to allocate funds to erect on the Gettysburg battlefield a monument, not necessarily to Virginia, but to Robert E. Lee. So I want you to imagine this. You're a Civil War veteran and let's say you're a David McMurdy Gregg, a Union cavalryman, a general officer who actually fought in the battle. You still live in Pennsylvania and you learn that your own state is going to give money to build a statue to Robert E. Lee on the Gettysburg battlefield. Or you're a veteran of the 83rd <clears throat> Pennsylvania that fought on Little Round Top. Or you're part of a Grand Army of the Republic post uh, in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. And you learn that your state, the state that was invaded by the Army of Northern Virginia in June and July of 1863, the, the same state that suffered uh, thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars in property damage, is going to, on the Gettysburg battlefield, erect a statue to Robert E. Lee. Union veterans who are alive in 1903 are outraged that the state of Pennsylvania would even consider this. And they were so vocal in their opposition that they actually put a halt to this plan to build a, a monument to Lee on the Gettysburg battlefield because they were so vocal about it. And one of the things I think we lose today uh, is the fact that Gettysburg as a place, as a preserved place, has been constantly evolving. So the original impetus behind creating a battlefield park here uh, actually takes place in the days and weeks immediately following the battle. And it's um, really a group of Gettysburg citizens who recognized, even in the days and weeks following the battle, while the wounded are literally still in barns and buildings all across the town, they recognize amidst all this carnage and, and chaos that despite that, something really significant had occurred in their town. And that in their home community, the Union Army, for the first time, really for the first time, won a decisive victory. And they recognized that. And so they wanted to create a memorial to, not a monument, but a memorial to what had happened here. And to the sacrifice of the Union Army that fought on the battlefield. And so they get together, they create an organization called the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. And the purpose of this group, like I said, is to create a memorial to the Union men that fought and died here. But rather than something out of stone or bronze or granite like the Virginia Memorial today, their idea was that the battlefield itself is going to be the monument, is going to be the memorial. The ridges, the hills, the woods where these Union soldiers, where they fought and died for the Union, uh, that's going to be the memorial. And that is a very radical idea in 1863. Americans really didn't preserve battlefield land uh, like this before. And uh, an example that I always throw out is the Bunker Hill Battlefield outside of Boston. I worked there for about two years. Uh, it's fought in June of 1775. It's kind of a, a, a moral, a morale-boosting uh, victory for the, uh, the Patriots, the Colonials that fought there, even though they technically lost the battle. Uh, but it's this major landmark event in the American Revolution. And in the decades that followed the Revolution... Uh, the citizens of Boston and Charlestown, where the battle was fought, they actually bought up part of the battlefield. They bought up part of uh, Bunker Hill. And they wanted to erect a monument on the hill to the Patriot battle there. Um, and they were going to make this big obelisk. It was going to look like the Washington Monument. And that's what they ended up building. But it was so expensive to build that, that they actually ended up selling off most of the battlefield. So they valued the physical structure more than the battlefield itself. And so today, when you go to Boston... Or when you want to go to the Bunker Hill Battlefield, you'll go, and what you'll find is this massive monument in the middle of a relatively small, what is essentially a city park today. The idea of the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association is very different. and In that sense, it's very radical. So they're going to preserve land. And that's what they end up doing. They go out, they buy up a lot of acreage, um, and by 1895, they have well over 500 acres of land. And again, this is a Union Memorial Park. It's not a battlefield where both sides are going to be honored. This is for Union veterans only. That's what it is intended for. So it's not a battlefield where we're going to go and we're going to kind of um, 
really uh, uh, celebrate the fact that after the war, the country gets back together. It's not a place where reconciliation is going to be talked about a lot. It is a union memorial. That's what it's intended to be. And so I think for union veterans, uh, after the war, they go home. Uh, they go back to their, their normal lives, those that can, those that survive. Uh, so they go back to farming, or they go back to being a shopkeeper, or they go work in a factory somewhere. And as the, the years pass, I think for Union veterans, they recognized the defining moment of their lives was what they did during the American Civil War, fighting in the Union Army. That defined them. That was the, 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 the pivot point of their existence. And for those veterans who served in the Army of the Potomac, and who fought at Gettysburg, Gettysburg becomes the defining moment of the defining event. And so what you have in the 1880s and 1890s are huge numbers of veterans returning to this Union Memorial Park to dedicate physical monuments to where they fought during the battle. So that's why when you drive around the park today, on almost every turn you encounter these, again, these physical monuments and memorials. The, the ones that we see on Little Round Top, like the 44th New York Monument, which is a very famous one, it's shaped like a castle, or the uh, monument to the 20th Massachusetts, which is uh, this big pudding stone rock on a pedestal. Uh, that was the Union veterans, their way of memorializing what they had accomplished and the, the comrades they had lost in a very physical sense. But that changes in 1895. In 1895, what happens is the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, they turn over all of their land to the federal government. And now for the first time, the Battlefield Park is going to be managed at a national federal level. Now it's not managed by the National Park Service or the Gettysburg Foundation. Uh, the National Park Service doesn't exist yet. So it's going to be managed by the War Department, uh, essentially the Department of Defense today. And they're going to have a very different kind of philosophy than the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. The, the national government, the federal government, the War Department, they're going to do a lot of great things. So they're going to build most of the roads that we still use today to explore the park. Uh, they're going to erect a lot of the towers that you can still go up and visit when you come here. Um, but they're also going to shift the focus of the battlefield park. So it's going to go from a Union Memorial Park to a place where we're going to talk about both sides. And we're really going to focus on the fact that once the American Civil War is over, and once the bloodshed and death and carnage has come to an end, the North and South are able to, in a sense, come back together. Uh, they're able to, to get past the horror of the American Civil War. Uh, they're able to reconcile. And so Gettysburg becomes a place where we're really going to celebrate the fact that uh, the country is whole again, the Union was preserved, these men who were once soldiers in the Union and Confederate Army, now they're back to their farms and their factories being productive citizens again. And we've been able to move past that. Uh, and so what ends up happening is that War Department, they create a commission made up of Union veterans and Confederate veterans. And they begin to create a lot of the tablets that we see on the battlefield today. And these tablets are supposed to tell the story of the battle without praise and without censure. They're just very matter of fact. And they still are on the battlefield today, and they're one of the best sources of information that we have that are on the physical landscape. And they're written primarily, again, by Union and Confederate veterans. But it's going to be a park where we're going to tell both sides of the story. And that really culminates in a lot of these blue and gray reunions that happen on the battlefield, uh, where Confederate veterans return to the battlefield, where Union veterans return to the battlefield, and in kind of these displays of, of affection and camaraderie, they shake hands over the stone wall, or they visit each other in their camps. And Americans in the, the late 1890s, early 1900s, all the way up to 1938, they love seeing these images of Union and Confederate veterans coming back to Gettysburg as friends again. Uh, and I think it showed the country that even with something as horrific and devastating as the American Civil War, they could move past it. But beneath that kind of veneer, there was a lot of tension. Uh, so we talk about how controversial the Confederate battle flag is today. Mm -hmm. It was controversial back in 1913 during the 50th anniversary of the battle and this uh, great peach jubilee, they called it, where thousands of veterans returned to the battlefield. A lot of Union veterans said they didn't want to show up if the Confederates were going to bring their battle flag. And a lot of the Confederate veterans said they weren't going to show up if they weren't allowed to bring their battle flag. And this happens again in 1938. So uh, Union veterans, they always guarded very jealously this place and their memory. Because again, to them, it was supposed to be where the Union victory was secured. And they don't mind honoring the Confederates 
for being brave or being good soldiers, but most Union veterans were very concerned about creating some kind of moral equivalency between what they did and what the Confederates did. And what we see happening is that as the battlefield changes hands, becomes a federal park, as uh, Union veterans begin to die and the Civil War generation begins to depart, we see a lot of Confederate monuments and memorials being placed in the battlefield. So the Virginia Memorial in the 19-teens, uh, the North Carolina Memorial in the 1920s, the Alabama Memorial in the 1930s, when those probably wouldn't have been placed had there still been large numbers of Union veterans who would have opposed them just like they did in 1903 when the state of Pennsylvania tried to, to erect a statue of Lee. Uh, so the battlefield is constantly, constantly evolving. And to get to Linda's point, um, sometimes the line between what a monument is and what a memorial is can be really blurred. And it can be difficult for us to distinguish the one between the other. And, you know, monuments and memorials are really, often they're very subjective. So I'm going to look at the Virginia Memorial, and, you know, on the one hand, I might see that as, as uh, painting this very heroic portrait of Robert E. Lee. He's on top of this pedestal, he's looking out over the battlefield, he's stoic. Uh, and on the other hand, I might look at that, uh, and let's say that I'm from Virginia, and let's say that I had a, a relative, a distant relative, who died in Pickett's Charge. Well, to me, that same memorial, that same monument, might be more of a memorial in that it, it as Ben was saying earlier, denotes the sacrifice and the loss of human life involved in the attack. So it's a really blurred line, and sometimes it's difficult, and, and sometimes... Uh, one monument memorial can kind of fall into both categories. Or just like the flag, so many people look at it and just see so many different things. And it can be very different, saying, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so I, at this point, I think it'd be great if we have questions either online or from the, the folks in the audience. Uh, we can take a few of those. Sure. Yeah. Does anyone in the audience have one before I go online? <clears throat> do, you, do you think, Chris, that this is a short-term issue, like the hype of it right now? Mm -hmm. kind of short term or do you think this is a more of a long term issue that the park will have to manage? And when you mean issue, you mean as far as Confederate monumentation, Monument Confederate memory? Flag. Yeah, well, that's a good question. So the question was, uh, this current debate that we're having as a country, uh, is this a short term thing or is this a long term thing? And I think how is the Park Service going to uh, deal with it? Yeah. And how are we going to deal with it? Well, I think, um, you know, as we just kind of talked about, a lot of this goes all the way back to the war itself. So it's a long, it's a long conversation we've been having. I, I think uh, the problem is when that conversation turns to violence, uh, as we've seen in Charlottesville and other places. Um, but as Americans, I think this is a testament to how central the American Civil War is to who we are as a people. Uh, that we're still dealing with a lot of the issues that we were dealing with in the 1850s and 1860s, and uh, some of them are, are really tough to get past. So. Uh, the American Civil War primarily is, is about a handful of things. Uh, it's about race. Uh, it's about slavery. It's about what it means to be an American. It's about the role of the federal government in the lives of people. And I challenge you today to pick up a newspaper or watch TV, any channel you want, regardless of what political spectrum you're on, uh, and you will find articles or news pieces about the role of the federal government in people's lives and what it means to be an American and race. So these are really long-term things, and I don't think, uh, at least in our lifetime, we'll ever really be able to get past them because they get to the very core of, of what does it mean to be an American and what does it mean to live here. Uh, I think the best thing that we can do, not only as American citizens, but uh, folks that live and work in Gettysburg, a, a place that is so central to how we as Americans remember the Civil War, is to keep having conversations like this and to keep... Uh, in, a, in a civil and constructive manner, talk about our past and, and how we should deal with it and how we should remember it. So I think um, this is going to be a long-term thing, but I think it also offers us a great opportunity to delve into our national past and talk about what makes us an American. And, and you know, as Lincoln said, um, uh, he, Lincoln, when he gives the Gettysburg Address, he kind of talks about the past, he talks about the present, but he also talks about the future. And one of the things I love about the Gettysburg Address is that in 272 words, uh, Lincoln is able to kind of tell us what it means to be an American. But it's also a very active document. Uh, being a citizen requires something of you. Uh, Lincoln calls it the, the great task remaining before us. 
I think each generation has that great task in front of them, and it might be different for each generation, but uh, being an American requires something of you. It takes work. It's not a passive thing. It's an active thing. Each of us has this great task. And I think one of the great tasks that we're dealing with now is dealing with how we remember the Civil War and the kind of the proverbial ghost in our closet. And I don't see that going away. But I also think that, again, that offers us an opportunity. Any other questions? I did get one from a, a friend's member earlier this week who asked, um, what is the National Park Service, and in particular Gettysburg National Military Park, doing to ensure the safety of the monuments and markers in the battlefield? Yeah, that's a great question, and thank you for whoever, whoever asked that. So the policy of the National Park Service is we're going to protect all of what we call resources that are in the park. And resources is kind of a, a jargony term. Um, the resources at Gettysburg are the monuments and the markers and the cannon, regardless if they're Union or Confederate, as well as the, the, physical, the physical land itself. Uh, but a resource at Yellowstone might be the bison. They might be the, you know, the geysers, Old Faithful. And if you go to the Grand Canyon, their resources are the physical canyon, the Colorado River, some of the great architecture uh, at the Grand Canyon. So the job of the National Park Service at Gettysburg is to protect our resources, and that's the monuments, regardless if they're Union or Confederate. Um, we fortunately have a, a great law enforcement division that is very active on the battlefield, and we have what I think is even better. We have a lot of people that care very deeply about this place and very deeply about, about the battlefield. Uh, and so we're going to continue to, to make that our, our, our mission, to protect this place. Uh, but it's also important to, to talk about the resources that we have in the park. And I think that's what we're doing today. But as far as the Park Service is concerned, uh, the Virginia Memorial is just like the bison at Yellowstone or the, uh, the, the redwoods out in California. They're part of the park, and so we're going to protect them. Um, it would, in this case, if anything were to change, it would really re require legislation from Congress for us to, to uh, alter the battlefield in any real sense. So uh, we're going to protect what we have in the park. Okay, I've got another interesting one from Eric and Susan Schultz. They ask, does Chris believe, based on the tour groups he leads, that the traditional division between North and South is healing or hardening, or neither? Is there any place on the battlefield, any story you tell that helps to promote healing? Is there any... I have, um, I have a, that's a great question, by the way. Thank you for asking that. I think there are a lot of moments when you look at the battle that, that evoke that sense of healing. Um, so I think about the aftermath of the battle and how terrible that was. I mean, you have upwards of 20,000 wounded men left behind in the community of Gettysburg. And every church, barn, building, farmhouse for miles around is transformed into a essentially emergency room. Uh, surgeons, doctors, nurses, volunteers are at work in the absolute worst of conditions trying to save, save lives. Uh, the Duke of Wellington, who um, fought during the Napoleonic Wars, he's the victor of Waterloo, he said something to the effect of there's nothing so melancholy uh, as a battle lost as a battle won. And what he's really talking about is just the physical destruction that battle causes. Uh, there's a young girl uh, named Cornelia Hancock who's from New Jersey. Hmm? Yeah. from New Jersey. <laughs> in the aftermath of the battle, uh, she travels to Gettysburg. Uh, it, and it's very much out of her kind of comfort zone, but she believes in it. So she travels to Gettysburg, and she spends the next few months of her life uh, on the battlefield, caring for the wounded at the Second Corps Field Hospital, and later at Camp Letterman. And she cared for wounded Union soldiers, but she also cared for wounded Confederate soldiers. And that experience really transformed how she thought about herself. So in the 1860s, there's kind of the, the woman's sphere and the men's sphere. The men's sphere was very much the public sphere and the woman's sphere was very much the domestic sphere. But one of the things the American Civil War does it is it kind of changes that dynamic. So now you have this young woman, Cornelia Hancock, treating these men in some remote part of the state for her, some remote part of the country, this little tiny Gettysburg community. And it really changes how she thinks about herself. And it changes, I think, the trajectory of her life. So she devotes the rest of her life to nursing, to healing. She serves throughout the rest of the American Civil War. She ends up having a very active post-war 
a career and life as a nurse. And so in the, the terror and horror of this battle, you have this young woman whose now mission in life is transformed for a very positive reason because of what she saw here and what she experienced here. Uh, I, think of, um, I think of the veterans. And a lot of times we, we try to underplay the fact that the country was able to come back together after the end of the war. Uh, but think about what would happen if there was no reconciliation that happened once the war was over. Uh, what if uh, the United States descended into essentially the reign of terror that follows the French Revolution? How terrible that would have been. As, as incomplete as the reconciliation was, as fraught and as uh, problematic as it was, particularly for the African American community who were liberated, uh, the, uh, slavery is ended, uh, but now in the South, through Jim Crow laws and black codes, a lot of the, the hard-fought things that they want are taken from them. And that's a terrible chapter in our history. But the fact that Union and Confederate soldiers in 1913 and in 1938 are able to come back to the battlefield here and just inhabit the same space, I think is a remarkable, a remarkable thing. And I think it shows the human capacity for forgiveness. And so I think you can look at this battle and you can draw from it a lot of lessons that, um, that uh, are ennobling as opposed to degrading. Uh, and I, mean, I think Gettysburg obviously is a huge cautionary tale. We have Americans doing their best to kill one another here for three days, and that's terrible. But you can find um, more positive takeaways, I think, from this, this battle. And those are, those are a few of them. Any other questions? Chris, given, yeah. the, uh, given the heated rhetoric out there right now, and as you explained earlier, it's perfectly reasonable uh, for people to see, for reasonable people to see both sides of some of these issues. What is the Park Service doing to um, educate the public? Are there any initiatives that you guys are undertaking to yeah, further sure. understand, understand these issues? So that's a great question. So what are we doing to, to educate the public and to have these, these kind of constructive dialogues with one another? Well, I think um, any time that people come to Gettysburg and they engage with their history, uh, that's an opportunity for us to do that very thing. So I think when you go to the Museum and Visitor Center and you go to the museum, that museum gallery, uh, that museum experience is literally designed to take you through the war. So you start out talking about what the war was all about. You talk about slavery. You talk about what exactly states' rights meant. Uh, you talk about, or you learn about, kind of the context behind the Battle of Gettysburg. It's not just, you know, 160,000 men shooting at each other for three days. There was a lot behind that. And so uh, as you explore the museum, hopefully you walk away with some of those, those things to ponder and think about, those big picture questions. I think what the Gettysburg Foundation is doing right now is a great opportunity to have a constructive dialogue. Just by, by having this event, by engaging people online, it's a great thing. Uh, the National Park Service, we have a full slate of, of programming that we offer throughout the year from our hikes and walks and talks uh, out on the battlefield to our winter lecture programs that take place every uh, January, February, and March. We have an education program I'm really proud of called the Great Task Youth Initiative that takes uh, young people who uh, probably never be able to come and visit the battlefield. We bring them to the battlefield and we talk about these very things. So what does the Confederate battle flag mean? How should we remember the American Civil War? Um, so the, the park and the foundation, I think we're doing a lot of different things to try to try to talk about these very important issues. And those are just a few of them. But again, I think what we're doing tonight is a great opportunity. we got another online question. Could you recommend a book or two, not about the battle so much, but about the changing interpretations of the Gettysburg battlefield? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, there are a couple of really good books that focus not so much on the kind of the tactical elements of the battle, but how Americans have understood uh, the Battle of Gettysburg and the American Civil War in the post-war period. So a great one is by Dr. Jen Murray. It's called On a Great Battlefield. And that book looks at how the National Park Service has managed the battlefield since uh, the 1930s. Uh, it's an excellent book, and it takes, takes readers all the way from, again, kind of the origins of the National Park Service's role in the battlefield all the way to the New Museum and Visitor Center in the, in the 2000s and kind of the birth of the Gettysburg Foundation. That's an excellent book. Uh, there's um, uh, a number of other really great works uh, that kind of focus on how Americans understood the American Civil War. Uh, there's a book by a professor named David Blight uh, called Race and Reunion that talks about how Americans 
kind of uh, remember the American Civil War. That is a, a great thing to read. It's hefty, but it's a really great book. Uh, and those are just a, a few. Uh, the, the scholarship on Gettysburg is incredibly vast. Uh, there are thousands of volumes that have been published on the battle. Uh, so those are two really good ones to start from. One's kind of a big picture, and one's much more focused on Gettysburg. Yeah, good question. We have another one from Tom. What is your favorite spot on the field to reflect on the battle and the terrible loss of life, and why does this spot speak to you? That's a good question. And a lot of times uh, people ask me what my favorite spot on the battlefield is. Um, it changes depending on, on what I'm reading or what I'm studying or what I'm preparing for. So... I spent uh, a lot of time focusing on Little Round Top, and uh, I would go from reading an account written by Oliver Wilcox Norton, who's Strong Vincent's bugler, to literally going up to the summit of the hill and being able to kind of piece together what Norton experienced. And those moments, I think, are very transcendent, and they're very transformative. Um, uh, we were just talking about Pickett's Charge, and I think one of the most awe-inspiring things you can do is read Frank Haskell's letter uh, at the Angle on Cemetery Ridge. And as I mentioned before, he's such a descriptive writer that you can almost sense the Confederate attack making its way across the battlefield. Uh, the National Cemetery uh, is a great place to go and kind of reflect on the human cost of the battle and that those big picture questions, what does it mean? Uh, not only because Abraham Lincoln gives the Gettysburg Address there, and uh, not only because a lot of the Union soldiers who died in the battle are, are buried there, but because the cemetery is now populated with those who died in a lot of our country's conflicts, from World War I and World War II uh, to the, the Vietnam conflict. So it kind of uh, bridges the kind of spectrum of, of American history from the Battle of Gettysburg onward. Uh, so it really depends. It just depends on what I'm reading and what I'm preparing for. But I think the power of the Gettysburg battlefield is you can go to, to this place, and you can find your own little piece of it. And it can um, provide you with an opportunity to kind of commune with the authenticity of place. Um, as long as we have this place, as long as we have this, this national park here, uh, it'll always be a place for Americans to come and, and dwell on who we are as a people and where we're going. Any more questions? But if you had to choose, what would be your absolute <laughs> favorite spot? If I had to choose, what would be my absolute favorite? Well, I think people are drawn to the battlefield for different reasons. So uh, the first time I ever visited Gettysburg was in 1989. And my family were actually going to Hershey Park, and they, they came here as a side trip. And I was you know, six or seven at the time. But we went to uh, East Cemetery Hill uh, near the Winfield Scott Hancock equestrian statue. And so that's my first memory of the Gettysburg battlefield. And so for a purely personal reason, that spot always speaks to me. It reminds me of my family and the first time I came here and how, how impactful that was to, um, to how I define myself and to what I do today. So that would probably be it. East Cemetery Hill, the Winfield Hancock statue. So even at six, you were, you were hooked? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was also fortunate that I grew up in a, in a period where popular culture was really gravitating towards the American Civil War. So there was the Ken Burns series that came out in 1989. There's a film, Glory, that came out the same year. Sure. A few years later, the film Gettysburg uh, came out. And so I, I think sometimes we underestimate the power of popular culture uh, in shaping how we remember the American Civil War. Uh, so a lot of people who come to Gettysburg, their, their vision of Pickett's Charge is the vision that they saw on the screen in the film Gettysburg. That's another reason why the 20th Main Monument is so popular now. It's because right. Joshua Chamberlain, the 20th Main, they're very prominent in the film Gettysburg and the novel The Killer Angels. And so that, uh, that idea that popular culture kind of shapes how we remember things uh, is very, very true when it comes to the Gettysburg battlefield. And it, it's a challenge sometimes, but it's also an opportunity sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so if we have time, I think, for maybe one more. Emily asks if we could circle back to the Confederate flag for a second. Absolutely. And she asks, why was the Confederate flag not banned immediately following the Civil War? considering that to the federal government, it represented treason and the death of a huge part of the population at that time. Well, the Confederate battle flag, um, and oftentimes when we talk about the Confederate battle flag, what we're talking about is the battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia. And um, when Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia surrendered at Appomattox, all of those battle flags become the property of the United States government. And uh, as I mentioned before, in the aftermath of the war, people returned to their pre-war lives. Uh, 
So northern soldiers, they go home to Minnesota or New Hampshire or Vermont, wherever they're from. They, they go back to their farms and their factories. Uh, the Confederate veterans who live, they go home to uh, an economy that's been devastated by the war, to physical ruin in a lot of its cities. And they're in a social structure that is completely turned upside down. Um, but the Confederate battle flags that belong to the federal government, at least the ones that were used in the battle, kind of the way that the Gettysburg battlefield evolves, our national understanding of the Civil War evolves too. So by the 1890s and early 1900s, and even during the, the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, there's this big push to return the captured Confederate battle flags back to the southern states. And I was talking earlier about how Union veterans were in uproar over the idea that there would be a Confederate monument in the Gettysburg battlefield. They were in an absolute uproar at the thought that these battle flags, captured in the heat of combat on Cemetery Ridge or on Missionary Ridge outside of Chattanooga or uh, at the Siege of Vicksburg, are now going to be turned over back to the, the former Confederate soldiers and back to these Confederate states. But they ultimately were. And so that's why uh, a lot of them are uh, in southern museums today. So the Confederate battle flag is controversial now. It was controversial back in the 1910s and 1900s and 1890s. Nothing's really changed about that. But um, for Confederate veterans, the battle flag ends up becoming I think, one of the most potent symbols of, of the Confederacy and of the lost cause, which is a, a phrase that kind of defines how a lot of Southerners wanted to remember the American Civil War. The lost cause uh, basically states that slavery was a secondary, if not a tertiary issue, that the Confederates only lost because they were outgunned and outmanned and outnumbered, and that they were brave and that they lost, but that doesn't necessarily mean that their cause was wrong. That's a vast oversimplification. But the Confederate battle flag becomes, again, one of the most visible symbols, besides Robert E. Lee himself, maybe, of that, of that idea. And so it's one that these uh, Confederate veterans, they hold very dear. And so by the time of these reunions at Gettysburg in the 1890s and 19-teens and 1930s, uh, the battle flag has all of a sudden kind of resurfaced. And I mentioned uh, earlier uh, the power of popular culture to kind of shape how Americans think about the Civil War. Well, in the 19-teens, a, a movie came out called Birth of a Nation. And that movie, which was wildly popular in the 19-teens, essentially depicts the Confederate Army as the good guys during the American Civil War and the Ku Klux Klan as kind of the heroes of, of Southern society in the post-war period. And uh, that helps to not only revive the Confederate battle flag, but also it helps to revive the Ku Klux Klan. Um, so again, the power of popular culture is, is really, really important. But the Confederate battle flag was always controversial. Uh, again, back in the days when Union and Confederate veterans were exploring the battlefield, and um, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Anyone in the room have a question? No? I do. Yeah. Do you, since you're out amongst people on a daily basis, do you feel that this controversy, the Confederate flag, Confederacy in, in general, is an overwhelming topic that you run into, or is this kind of a, like a mass media creation? Well, no, I think, I think it's a genuine issue. I think it's a genuine issue. Um, I think, obviously, the, the power of social media makes it a much more visible issue. I think it makes it much more easier for people to contribute to the conversation, uh, provided it's a constructive conversation. But I, I think it's a legitimate thing. And again, we've always, we've always kind of battled over how we were going to remember the Civil War at places like Gettysburg. Because Gettysburg, maybe more than any, anywhere else in the country, is kind of where Americans are going to remember the Civil War. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's the mecca of Civil War sites. And so it's always been an issue. But I think when violence happens, and we've seen that recently, we've seen that in Charleston, South Carolina a few years ago, and we've seen it recently in Charlottesville, what that does is it, 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 takes, it takes things to a tipping point, and that's when it becomes really, really heated. Uh, and I think um, that's a cautionary tale for all of us. We should be able to talk about our past and how we remember that past in a way that's constructive and civil and uh, responsible. And again, I think that's what we're doing tonight. Yeah. Anyone else? I think we have one final question online, which is something I never heard of. I'm sure you have, though. Can Mary asks if you could talk about the Bonnie Blue flag? The Bonnie Blue flag. So there are, um, 
beginning of the American Civil War, the 1860s, or excuse me, 1860, 1861, and the Confederacy exists. But they don't have any of the trappings of a nation. They're literally inventing this as they go. So the Confederacy, uh, they have to figure out, okay, what is their national symbol going to be? They have to write a constitution. They have to establish a form of government. And for a lot of these things, they borrow from the United States. So their Confederate Constitution is very similar to the United States Constitution, except for the issues of slavery and the, the terms of the president and a couple other minor things, but it's essentially the same as the United States. And they also have to develop a flag. And a lot of times individual states develop flags that were different from one another, um, but to develop a national flag uh, took a lot of time. And so the Bonnie Blue flag is an early Confederate flag that appears particularly in battlefields uh, like Manassas, these early 1861 battlefields. Um, and then there was another uh, called the Stars and Bars. A lot of times when we say Stars and Bars, people think the Confederate battle flag, but it was actually different from the Confederate battle flag, and it looked a lot more like the American flag. It had three big bars and kind of a field. And um, The problem was that in battle, things are confusing, things are chaotic, and a lot of times it was difficult for opposing armies when looking at the opponent's flag to figure out, okay, is that a Union unit or is that a Confederate unit? Is that a Union regiment or is that from Alabama? Um, and so by late 1861, early 1862, they're developing a new flag. Uh, and this one was really designed by a man named William Porcher Miles. And that's really the battle flag that we think of today. Um, but the Bonnie Blue flag was one of many Confederate symbols that were created during the American Civil War. The only one that's really still a, a touchstone today, the only one most Americans really uh, really recognize is the battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia. But the Bonnie Blue flag is one of them. Yeah. Cool. Okay, well I think it's about time to wrap up. I would like, really like to thank Chris, uh, <laughs> Chief pleasure. of Interpretation and Education at Gettysburg National Military Park, for leading us today. I'd like to thank Jacob Schindel of Ragged Edge Coffee House for hosting, hosting our event this evening. And of course, our audience here and all of you for tuning in. Uh, we really would love to keep the conversation going. And you could do that by joining us, joining the friends, getting involved, and, and coming to, to the National Military Park and experiencing this for yourself. I learned a lot today. I hope you guys did too. And just thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you. Bye.